Congressman, let me start with you. Uh, t talk to me about the, the, the state of things right now. We have on-again, off-again negotiations. We have about 10 days. We have a call for uh, Republicans to come over and sign on on a, an effort to just get this vote passed, a clean vote passed. And we have discussions about the 14th Amendment. All of these are remarkably serious things. What's the state of play? Ali, it sounds uh, complex, but it's really pretty simple. We don't negotiate about whether we pay our bills in America. We pay our bills. Democrats did this when Donald Trump was president, and now President Biden needs to pay the debt. And this is not Congress against the president. This is Congress trying to abrogate what past Congresses have done. Past Congresses have said, pay this money. President Biden needs to pay it. We had a discharge petition saying basically President Biden uh, pay the debt. 210 Democrats signed it on day one. Two other Democrats are expected to sign in Monday. That gets us to 212 with one person we still have to convince. We just need six Republicans to sign that, and I think there's going to be growing pressure for them to do that. Uh, Bob, I want to ask you about the, the constitutionality of this, because this is actually in the Constitution. It's not an abstraction. The 14th Amendment says America has to pay its debts. Even if it weren't in the Constitution, one should assume that's what you do. And a country does not pay its debts. It is in default. That's the worst kind of stuff. You have high interest rates. You have inflation. People, people leave your economy. But even if this went to court, your, your thought on this is that there are a lot of originalists, uh, textualists on the Supreme Court the Constitution says what it says. You have to pay your debts. The Constitution says what it has. I mean, uh, uh, I have my Constitution right here. I can read it to you. The validity of the public debt of the United States shall not be questioned. If you have an originalist on the Supreme Court who says, we've got to go exactly by the words of the Constitution, and we've got to understand where those words came from, then the president is clear. Uh, the president has a constitutional duty he has made and taken an oath of office to follow the Constitution. And anybody who says otherwise is not paying very much attention. Uh, the economic calamity that would ensue failing to pay our bills, not honoring the full faith and credit of the United States, has never happened before because we've never had a default before. People may be confused about this, Ali. I mean, some people say, well, we've had government shutdowns before. Yes, we have. Uh, in fact, I've been through government shutdowns in my capacity as a government official. They're not pleasant. They're not nice. But this is different. A default on the debt of the United States means that the full faith and credit of the United States around the world, to all of our creditors, all the bondholders, all the people who are expecting to get Social Security checks, none of them will be safe. Congressman, I, I have trouble calling this a negotiation because it's not supposed to be a debatable matter. Um, it, it, it's akin to saying, I won't shoot you in the head if you give me a peanut butter sandwich. It's like, I would like if you don't shoot me in the head, maybe we can discuss a peanut butter sandwich. The Republicans say they're negotiating lowering spending, right? Let, tell me what that looks like, because there are things that they are asking for right now in order to agree to raising the debt limit. Well, first of all, as you pointed out in your opening, there's a separate process for that, the budget process. And Democrats have said, we'll talk about it. But the issue is, A, a revenue problem. The reason, uh, if you want to lower the deficit, what we ought to be doing is repealing the Trump and Bush tax cuts to the very wealthy. They won't do that. They're instead trying to hurt the poorest Americans, the most vulnerable Americans at a time that people are hurting in the economy. And they're not willing to talk about the almost trillion-dollar defense budget uh, which is most of the discretionary budget. We've said, let's have some of the cuts there. It's really important to understand that the vast majority, I think 70% of the deficit has been accumulated under Republican presidents, not Democratic presidents. Bob Rice, let's talk about what happens. Uh, you said it's a very different thing. It's not a government shutdown. We know government shutdowns are bad, but a lot of Americans who, who say, I've seen a couple of them, it doesn't have that much impact on my life. Talk to me about, because, because a, a, a default has a macro impact. It does things broadly to the economy, which will trickle down and hit people. And it does specific things to certain people as it relates to their income. 
Uh, Ali, uh, the worst thing about a default is that we don't know exactly what it would do. We know it would create chaos. We know that it would reduce and eliminate uh, the full faith and credit of the United States, that all the global bondholders of the United States would no longer trust the United States, uh, that America would no longer have the capacity to continue uh, doing what we want to do. In fact, it could explode the deficit. Uh, because, uh, you know, there are so many ways in which the economy would contract and collapse and tax revenue would therefore decline and the deficit would go up. I mean, uh, this is not just a nuclear option. This is this is sort of uh, the end of time option, Armageddon option. And you don't want to do that. Uh, there's no reason to do it. Uh, the fact that you don't have a single Republican in the House willing to join the Democrats and avoiding this Armageddon itself is frightening. Ro Khanna, you, you had mentioned that there's, you know, there are two ways to solve uh, money that you think is, you know, a budget that's off, and that is you either uh, cut spending or you increase revenue or you do both. The, the Republicans are proposing a bunch of things, including some work requirements on, uh, on things that people receive, whether it's Medicaid or, or food stamps or temporary financial assistance. Many of those cases already have work requirements, but, but the interesting thing here is that we have 3.5 percent unemployment in this country. We don't have a work ethic problem in this country. We have people who don't use their vacations, don't take time off. But we are leaning into this thing that we leaned into during COVID and we always seem to lean into is that let's take stuff away from the least among us right now. That's a way to cut the budget. Well, first of all, you pointed out there already are work requirements. President Clinton, to some controversy, put those requirements in the 1990s. They exist. Here's what the Republicans want to do. They want to now take away the benefits, take away food stamps, take away health care from the most vulnerable, and there's going to be zero increase in actual employment because of, there have been studies that have been done that show all this yeah. is going to do is take away the benefits. And the Democrats have said it's a non-starter. Absolutely not. We're not going to uh, allow that. And it does nothing to lower, lower the deficit. I mean, that's a fraction of the actual budget. Bob, you've studied this very closely, this whole idea of inequality. That's, Ro Khanna is exactly right. It will not increase employment. It will not get what Matt Gates called couch potatoes uh, off of couches because most Americans are working. The, the, all we have is a mismatch between open jobs and, and people looking for work. But it will actually cause fewer people who are at the lowest end of the economic pole to get money. Uh, yes, and indeed, there have been two studies uh, just done uh, showing that the effect of a, a default would, at the minimum, be about 3 million jobs. It could be as high as 8.2 million jobs. It's not just the people at the bottom are going to be affected. We, I mean, uh, working class people, uh, middle class people are going to be uh, affected. I, I, a default would, in a way, I think it's not too, too far-fetched to say explode the economy. Now, if the president were to go along with what the Republicans want and hurt the most vulnerable members of this society, we would be turning our back on the biggest problem we have in America today, apart from democracy and preserving democracy, which is widening inequality. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we have a small group of people at the top who are raking in most of the economic gains of the economy, have been doing so for years, and we have a larger and larger number of vulnerable Americans, including a lot of working class people who have voted for Donald Trump in the past because they're so frustrated and so angry and so mystified at how they, why they're not getting ahead. Well, you can imagine, you can imagine what that is going to do in and of itself. Roger, you and I have had many conversations like this in which I am a brand newbie to this. I do not have TikTok on my phone. I don't know how one TikToks and I don't understand much of this stuff. And now all we talk about is AI. And as you know, I'm, I'm also a newbie at that. So help me out here. Talk to me about this ban in TikTok. So, Ali, the issue here is that the federal government has done absolutely nothing to protect Americans from the harm being done by Internet platforms. You and I have been talking about this since 2017. Facebook had a profound effect on the 2016 election. And all Internet platforms have done massive harm to public health during the pandemic and to our politics and to just about every aspect of our lives. And TikTok is the latest 
big, big deal here. And because it's owned by the Chinese, it's politically attractive to attack them. They are, however, quite a lot smaller than Facebook in the United States, a lot smaller than Instagram, a lot smaller than, than YouTube, all of which do exactly the same kind of harm and collect a lot more data. The Chinese are able to buy data on every single American from Oracle. So the issue here is Gianforte is trying to body slam TikTok in order to get some kind of political gain. But he's not wrong that this is harmful. And he's also not wrong that states do need to act because the feds have not done their job. Is there a job to do? Because you and I have sat and, generally speaking, watched a lot of these congressional hearings on technology and phones and Twitter and all this stuff. And sometimes the, the people who are there to testify are amazing and brilliant and have lots of good information, but they get stupid questions because we're not really up to speed on how we're supposed to regulate technology. Well, let, let's be clear. Internet platforms are the source of most of the fundraising dollars that come into candidates these days. It is the way that candidates communicate with the electorate. So as a consequence, there is no incentive right now for any politician to get on the wrong side of an internet platform. They fear that the internet platform can put its thumb on the scale and put the politician out of office. That fear is preventing any kind of action in Washington. You've seen in Illinois a law to protect people from facial recognition. You've seen in California a law to protect the citizens on private data privacy. The thing that's going on with Gianforte is a joke because it is not possible for the state of Montana to implement this. It is, however, absolutely the right thing to call attention to parents that their children are using a platform that is causing great harm and they shouldn't be doing that. And we've got to somehow change the culture so we stop accepting what technology companies tell us about their products and stop using them just because they're fun. Now, let's say we stop using them. There's a woman who's suing Google right now, not that she was using a platform. She, she claims that she was uh, filling out a form uh, having to do with Planned Parenthood or a scheduling application that's actually, I don't know, powered by or run by the back office is Google uh, and that Google has access to that information. Now, you have given me some version of this story for years that it may not be the email provider you use or the social media site you're on, but these companies, including Google, have lots of data on you that you may not even know about yourself, uh, but they certainly have that data. And there's no law as to how they're or there are many laws as to how they're supposed to handle that. Well, in the United States, we've taken the position that corporations are allowed to collect data any way they can get it. And they're allowed to claim ownership of any data that they touch. And as a result, companies like Google have built their entire business model on capturing data and then either exploiting it themselves or in other companies' cases, selling it to third parties. And that behavior has put all of us at great risk. You sit there and think to yourself, well, hey, I don't use Google, therefore I'm safe. But that's not how it worked. This woman did not have a relationship with Google. She had a relationship with Planned Parenthood. And because Planned Parenthood had a relationship with Google, the data w went to Google. And Google is claiming that that amounts to consent by the woman. This is a really important case because there's no reason why Google should have the rights to that data. They certainly shouldn't be able to monetize it. And the courts have done a terrible job for citizens. Essentially, you know, we treat corporations as people too. It's time to treat people as corporations, to give people the same kind of power we give corporations to protect themselves in court and in the law. Yeah, uh, when Mitt Romney said people or corporations are people, uh, what he, I think he, what, what would have been better to say is that if people only had the protections that corporations do in some cases, we'd be better. Uh, Roger, we run out of time to talk about AI, but I, I'm, let's just, you and I have a, a, an understanding invitation. You're going to come I back. Get it one word. It's just the whole thing is spin. It yeah. is all phony. This is quite a week uh, in North Carolina. We actually had the governor on last, uh, you know, last Saturday morning this happened. Last Sunday, I spoke to the governor about it, and he was really hopeful that uh, that he'd be able to, you know, that not he would, but that, that North Carolina voters and activists would be able to, to turn somebody uh, over. It didn't happen. And, and, and generally speaking, that feels like a sad thing for North Carolinians and their rights. You see it differently. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that there, obviously it was a disappointment, right, when Representative Cotham and and no other Republican honestly voted to sustain Governor Cooper's veto last week. And we we saw the, or this week, I mean, and we saw the turmoil in that, right, when we're seeing uh, rights stripped away from folks across our state for reproductive freedom. But that doesn't mean that we stop fighting. Our party is a party of resistance, and we always have been from Republican oppression in our state. When you think about how far our party and our state actually has come since we're an over Overcome Republican gerrymandering and racial gerrymandering from the Republican at the state legislative level. I really do believe that we have an opportunity here to galvanize Democrats and folks across our state who believe in bodily autonomy and reproductive freedom in order to change their minds, honestly, and say, like, you know, my opportunity is this year and getting involved is is more important now than ever uh, because we have the opportunity to change the future of our state and take it back and build it up to being uh, what we know it can be. So there are a couple of things going on. First of all, in North Carolina, you have a lot of statewide officials who are Democratic, who, who, who win in a statewide election. And yet your your legislature and your house are completely uh, uh, they have veto proof Republican majorities now. How, what does taking it back look like? What does doing the right thing look like? Is this people you're getting to vote? Is it people you're getting to run? Is it people who you're convincing who might have voted Republican to say this abortion stuff is, is, a, is a, a bridge too far? Well, if I'm doing it right, it's all of the above, right? <laughs> um, in some capacities, I think it's got to be a little bit of everything. And in order for us to have the, the right mix of what we need in North Carolina this year, it has to be strong candidates at every state and House and Senate seat, right? In uh, 2022, we left 44 seats uncontested last cycle. And that's not something the North Carolina Democratic Party plans to do again. And so we are recruiting folks from across North Carolina. If you'd like to run, please head to ncdp.org to make sure that you're signed up with us and ready to go for 2023. Because municipal elections are happening this year and battleground 2024 for us starts with battleground 2023. We want to contest municipal races and give folks to an opportunity to vote for somebody else on a ballot because we know that democracy is not democracy without choices. And voters across North Carolina haven't had a choice in a lot of their elections in the last few years. And so the Democratic Party is prioritizing that. But we also know that the two jobs of a Democratic Party is to get out our base and to make sure we're protecting our incumbents. And we didn't do that in 2020. 20 or in 2022, for mm-hmm. that matter. You know, Joe Biden lost our state by 100,000 votes. Sherry Beasley lost our state by 134,000 votes. And that, to me, are Democrats that didn't have their doors knocked, didn't have their phones called, and didn't understand that we are active and in their communities year-round. And that's the organization that I want to build across North Carolina this year, because I know it's, what's, it's what wins elections. When Democrats across our state get organized and energized and put together, Republicans lose. And they know that. And they're scared of that. I have just a little bit of time left, but I want to ask you, what about the rest of it? The the rural white South is a very comfortable, well-worn slipper for Republicans. You also want to go there and, and convince people to vote for Democrats. Yeah, I think that we have a really interesting depiction when we think about what rural really means. And, you know, I, I understand that rural to a lot of folks means white and it means white Republicans. But to me, it honestly means black and brown populations across rural North Carolina. Person County, where I'm from, is the, the city of Roxborough within it is 51 percent black. And when I became the Person County Democratic Party chair, I made the first headline in North Carolina by the fact that we flipped the Roxborough City Council from red to blue with three amazing black Democrats who are representative of the community that they were from and that they were both about the issues that that community was really driving towards and pushing for. And so we need to do that across North Carolina. And I know it's possible in a lot of our communities that we have just have not been active in because we've been writing off rural North Carolina as something that is, you know, Trump country or full of Republicans. And to me, everybody's worth talking to. And we've Mm -hmm. got to make sure that's the message this year.